Hello, good evening. Uh, I am Annelies Broekman from TREA, which is a research institute on terrestrial ecology. And I'm going to moderate and introduce to you the session of today on rural development boost through research transfer to the transfer of knowledge of research and uh, excellence into rural development. So I welcome you to this session. And uh, today with me together, there is Giuseppe Provenzano from the Union of the Mediterranean Research and Innovation uh, Division, and in collaboration presenting with Almota Sabadi, the Managing Director and Senior Regional Cooperation hear. Expert. So we have a double representation Sorry. from the Union of the Mediterranean, even if Giuseppe is uh, here physically with us in the in the session and after we also have Ali Ruma with a senior project officer at the Prima Foundation and then Sihan Jedari from the Institut National de Recherche en Génie Rural OFORE which we uh, have an acronym like Ian Angres and she is the project coordinator of FASTER project so welcome everybody to this uh, session. It will take one hour and a half. We will start providing an overview of the FASTER project for your reference and then open the floor to our uh, colleagues in the round table. And when all the information is put on the table, then we will ask through the chat to participate in a rich debate on how to transfer research excellence to sustain rural development. Thank you so much. So I will start uh, telling you that the FASTER project, FASTER, is an acronym for Farmers Adaptation and Sustainability in Tunisia through Excellence in Research. So the project aims to reinforce IANGREF, Research Institute, leading research institute in Tunisia, by boosting its leadership and positioning as a research excellence center and help to in for process of internationalization and its capacity to innovate, as well as scientific quality and productivity. On the other hand, project, the project uh, wants to ensure that the transfer of all this knowledge generated in IANGRES on adaptation in land and water management will be transferred to the Tunisian agricultural sector. And we do that through the use of the farm advisory system already in place and promoted by the Ministry of Agriculture in Tunisia. So to introduce our consortium, who we are, so apart from IANGRES, uh, the consortium is composed by a Tunisian higher education umbrella institution it's called IRESA and the responsible agency for delivering farm advisory in Tunisia called AVFA. Uh, on top of that, we have two European research institutes, CREA, the institute I am partnering with, and Lund University, as well as two companies that are providing technical support to the project and to its implementation. And so we have Vision Communication and Europe for Business, also in the, our board. So you can see it's a highly diversified consortium and uh, working together on these main goals. So what did we do? What do we want to do to comply, to comply with all these ambitious goals? No? So for improving Iangre's national and international positioning, FASTA promoted the increased scientific publications, engagement in international research proposals and consortia for international competitive funding like European projects, and uh, as well as increased attendance to national or international events like the one we are doing now today. And also, this is very good because we want to support IANGREF in exploring potential collaboration agreements with existing international networks and bilateral meetings with decision makers in Tunisia. So for improving, uh, the, this, is, uh, this is already a whole program. But on top of that, we want to improve the research excellence of Iran-Greve researchers themselves. So not only as an institute, but also 
uh, work with EARGRAF staff to get familiar uh, with these uh, aspects of research excellence. Therefore, we promoted training programs uh, with international lectures to boost capacitation in the field of adaptation in water, forest, and land management, as well as on cross-cutting issues needed to put into value the research done, such as writing peer-reviewed articles or competitive projects for researchers in an earlier career stage. Furthermore, mobility uh, programs uh, allow short-term visits uh, of Tunisian researchers to the European Research Institutes of the Faster Consortium with the aim to promote access to PhD programs and specific joint research projects. So really putting hands up, hands on all these uh, needs. So further on, for enabling uh, these innovation, uh, innovative solutions developed in this research excellence uh, framework, and to share the knowledge and best practices that are generated and mainstreaming the results into local farmers and policy makers, Foster created a living lab to provide support to the farm advisory system. Living labs actually are a tool for promoting open innovation, an approach designed to enhance cooperation between multiple actors sharing the same state, like in this case, rural development. So, such as researchers, public administration, companies, and users like farmers or other stakeholders engaged in the agricultural sector. Faster Project Living Lab focuses on transferring knowledge on adaptation to climate change between researchers in the field of water, soil, and forest management, but together with practitioners engaged in the farm advisory system in Tunisia. Therefore, we want, we have this highly multidisciplinary uh, environment. We have a multi-actor platform participating in this living lab. And uh, in order to be all on the same page and really ensure that all this diverse uh, knowledge is uh, understood and streamlined, we also provide a summer school program to capacitate farm advisory staff and practitioners for taking up the information. And so be able, at their turn, to provide this tailored support to farmers on the impacts of climate change and opportunities for adaptation. So in order to guarantee the sustainability of the project, also after it ends, uh, we uh, are promoting an e-learning platform. So all the trainings and information and knowledge generated through the FASTED project, which is three years of intensive work, all this knowledge will be gathered on an online platform created to host all the courses and capacitation programs and to make them available for interested participants. And provided the situation of the COVID pandemic, of the pandemic of the COVID, actually it was a wonderful element that helped us to deliver the programs and the living lab interactions in a virtual way, even during the implementation of the project, actually. So we needed to adapt ourselves to changing conditions. So this was a very short presentation on FASTA. There are many interesting aspects, and we invite you to uh, contact the project for further details. But we hope that we will offer some opportunities at the end to research institutes already in a high level of excellence, like Ian Greff and Tunisian partners, to further develop their position in the international research environment and increase the number of successful innovative project proposals and establish a dynamic of mutual learning between practitioners from over the Mediterranean re region from the agricultural sector uh, on adaptation to climate change, to global change. So thank you very much. And uh, this was a short introduction. Now I would like to pass on the word to uh, to Giuseppe Provenzano, uh, representing and sharing with us information from on the subject on the Union for the Mediterranean. Thank you so much. Thank Hello, you, Giuseppe. Moderator. Hello, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, moderator, for this great uh, uh, introdu introductory speech, uh, which effectively ties very well uh, in, in the topic of research innovation, which is key for the development of our Mediterranean region uh, in general, for the whole Mediterranean region, but also for rural areas in particular. 
Uh, actually, uh, our work at the Union for the Mediterranean focuses heavily on the subjects of research and innovation from one side and sustainable development as a horizontal topic to the other. So um, I prepared a small presentation. Uh, uh, perfect. Thank you very much, which uh, will help me to present some of the points where I would like to raise your attention here today. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, I would like to uh, mention a topic which uh, often uh, is uh, um, a bit overlooked in our region and in general when we develop new action for sustainable development, which is higher education and research as really as a tool for developing our region, uh, for developing both urban and rural areas, and especially in our region where we experience uh, a very young population, which translates uh, to a very high number of university students in our region. We see that there are more than 30 million university students right now in the Euro-Mediterranean region. By this, at the Union for the Mediterranean, for Euro-Mediterranean region, we mean uh, the 42 countries which come from, the, from Europe and the southern and eastern Mediterranean. As we see, we have here a huge potential for sustainable growth to, uh, by using the brightest uh, minds uh, that we have available, our youth, which is the, the most educated generation ever in our history. At the same time, unfortunately, we have to, to see that we have um, very high rates of uh, people, of young people that are not in training, that are not working and that are not creating enterprises, which is a huge loss. In some countries, it's even up to 32 percent, which is almost a third. Uh, we have also some of the highest level of unemployment rates in the region. So in some countries, even 25%. It's a quarter of graduates which are not contributing to the sustainable development of our economies. We have here uh, a huge potential. Uh, let's, uh, let's be honest, we have 40% uh, as seen as the possible uh, increase in enrollment rates in higher education uh, institutions, which means that uh, if we bet on, uh, on the educated people and the research we can uh, contribute to unlock our, uh, our, our common growth. At the same time, we see that uh, a barrier to hiring is given by the mismatch existing by the training being offered in uh, university and research centers and the requirement of the business sector, the private sector. 32% uh, of the companies uh, have, uh, have uh, underline that there is uh, a mismatch between what they need and what is offered from uh, the, the training market. Next. On this, uh, uh, we see a huge contribution to what is the youth unemployment, which is one of the biggest challenges that we need to overcome together in our region. Uh, as you can see in, uh, from this table, which is extracted from uh, ILO data, uh, when we see that there is a 5% of total unemployment in the world, in, in our region, the number is significantly higher. And even more worryingly, we see that uh, youth unemployment tends to be slightly higher. And we can see also that the rates of youth female unemployment uh, are uh, higher than what we would like to see. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, the backdrop of a significant increase in uh, population in some areas. 20, uh, in, in the last 20 years, we've seen the doubling of our population in North Africa, which means that we have a youth bulge in the moment that we need to exploit in order to contribute to our growth. Of course, we are talking about systemic challenges. Education and innovation cannot be part uh, the, the, all of the solution, but it can, can contribute in a significant amount to be part of the solution. Next. This is why the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, since we try to foster dialogue between uh, all the stakeholders from the south and the north of the Mediterranean on uh, topics uh, of sustainable development, uh, we have been trying to develop uh, a community of practice between uh, the world of work, the labor market, the job market, the ministries of labor, the employers, and the world of training, the academia, so the universities, the research centers. Well, we have uh, organized a great meeting uh, as, a, as a side event to a Ministerial of Labor of the Union for the Mediterranean, where we try to put together representative of these two worlds, and we try to see what could have been um, a way forward, some new solutions in order to uh, use academia for unlocking development. If you can go to the next slide. 
So these are some takeaway points where we will try to focus our action and where we would like to invite you to, to reflect more. So what could be some uh, objectives for common work together? First of all, we, ha we are experiencing a, a world that is changing, skills are changing, and the needs for skills are going to be changing. This means that uh, in 20 years, the skills that are going to be uh, fought right now, the curricula are not going to be updated with a, a continuously changing world. We have seen it now with COVID. What was required one year ago it's for, for working in our work environment is not what is needed now. We are seeing it because uh, today we are meeting in a digital format. We have seen the explosion of this format as a way of reacting to a changing scenarios. This is an opportunity for growth. If we can take it, I can, if, we, if we can use it in a proactive way. So we need to offer new competencies for transitioning in, uh, into this changing economy. We need to focalize, to focus on what, is the, what are the needs of our territories. In this case, rural areas. What are the needs that we can foresee in, in our changing scenarios, in, what in our shifting economies? And how can we be proactive into training our people for producing for this economy? This leads to the topic of improving the flows of communication, the information flows between academia and between the job markets. This requires mobilizing some platforms where we can exchange needed information. And at the same time, we need to transfer knowledge uh, more fluidly. Some areas in the world are doing it very well. I'm thinking about North America. Some other areas of the world can profit from the lessons that already are existing. And finally, and this is a point for rural areas, we need to work more for exploiting the potential existing into the sustainable economy uh, economies, which means blue economy, bioeconomy, agriculture. Later, we are going to see uh, to, uh, some example coming from, uh, from Prima, a great partner of the Union for the Mediterranean. Next. So in order to follow up on what we've seen was a part, uh, was a way forward, was a path forward, uh, we have tried to launch with a sustainable the German development cooperation, a new initiative in order to connect as much as possible academia and the job markets. We've been calling this innovation employability nexus, which can be uh, a tool for developing uh, the Mediterranean. Next. We launched this year a consultatory process. So we created some uh, uh, steering committee, some uh, questionnaires. We have done uh, interview, semi-structured interviews with all kinds of stakeholders, going from a supranational institution, the European Commission, our co-presidency, the OECD, but also universities, a university networks, so representatives of the private sector. And now we are preparing a short publication, which we are go I'm going to present a bit later. And next year, we are going to materialize some trainings where we will be invited, of course. Next. I would just would like to point out to some food for thought coming from um, a, a questionnaire, which we've been sharing among our partner, which I think will uh, help us uh, see some topics where we, we will need to work more together. Next. First of all, we, we are seeing that uh, um, they've been indicating as the main targets for working uh, high education and research institutions, which are universities, which, which are research centers, but also, and this is more interesting, to work more directly uh, with private enterprises and with the private sector. Uh, whereas the third sector is seen as already engaging a lot with universities. So it means that we need to, uh, to try to work both uh, with the universities, but at the same time to create innovative approaches for the private sector. Next. Other uh, stakeholders which have been mentioned as key for working together were, were the medias, but also the HR training recruiting agencies and this year, especially hospitals. Uh, before, we have, um, maybe this, uh, this stakeholder was not seen as fundamental as we've seen this year. Uh, and so stakeholders have been uh, mentioning it more and more in our meetings. But also with development, uh, uh, sustainable development agencies, think tanks and funding agencies. Next. 
Now going to the teams, we have tried to split up uh, the teams about employability where there is more opportunity for, uh, for work and the teams of innovation. Going on teams connected to employability, we have seen that industrial uh, intern in internships, digital skills and soft skills, but also working more on partnership, we'll see as something where there was much more work to be done. A mention uh, needs to be done with entrepreneurship, which uh, in some countries and in some areas is left as something which you are born with. We know that entrepreneurship is a topic that needs developed. There are some skills we need to be fostered and where we see that um, new approaches need to be taken in some areas. Uh, we, yes, we know that there are some great uh, best practices already in the field, but they are not yet done in a systematic way. Next. So we want to develop this, uh, this new nexus on innovation entrepreneurship. And partners have been responding that one of the best ways for doing it is through innovative research programs in partnership with industries. This uh, requires, first of all, to see uh, a, a new way of, uh, of connecting uh, public, the public sector, which is academia, which is often mm, not equipped with the right tools with engage with the, with, the, with the private sector, which is more dynamic, which can be more uh, adapted to, the, uh, to what is the, the job markets. Uh, at the same time, universities tend to be more conservative. So we need to, and sometimes to adapt laws, to uh, adopt best practices, to involve them into, uh, for instance, uh, in the curricular decisions. Then we have the question of research funding, which needs to tap more in what is offered by the, 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 by the private sector. Often researchers only look at public uh, oppor uh, opportunities. And then uh, uh, there is uh, a tool which is working more on incubators and accelerators and startup support. Again, uh, we have great example even in the Mediterranean. I'm thinking about Lebanon, I'm thinking about Tunisia, which has enacted new laws. And then the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the national policies need to be adapted. Next. Other frameworks in include the qualification frameworks. This is something which is uh, not perhaps evident when we talk about Europe, because we have already developed uh, a framework for recognizing the qualifications of somebody from, the, from Spain that can go and work in, uh, for instance, in Italy or they can go to Germany. This is sometimes not the case outside of Europe. So working more on the qualification frameworks could be a great way for increasing uh, uh, the movement of the minds and contribute to a brain circulation. Then, of course, uh, working more on social innovation and knowledge transfer, it could be a great way for creating new partnership. Next. So finally, uh, all these ideas have, uh, in a way, uh, fed the preparation of a handbook that we are working on right now. So we are preparing this uh, short handbook. We are talking about 100, 120 pages, where we wanted to highlight First of all, best practices that already exist in the region. This is a region where there is a great work for supporting the development in our, in our, uh, in our, in our areas, where there are universities which are very active, research centers which are working with the private sector, but also institutions which are engaging in innovative ways. We are not starting from zero. There is a great community to feed on, and we are detailing some initiatives, some ideas, which can be, first of all, joined, first of all, a second, replicated. Uh, this uh, has been the result of one year of consultation with a lot of partners, and we are going to present this new publication uh, digitally, of course, uh, on the 2nd of December. If you go to the next slide, please. This is just a sneak peek for uh, some of the topics that are going to be mentioned. We are, we are going to talk about skills, we are going to talk about teaching, learning, we are doing uh, some specific focus on collaborative doctorates, which is uh, industrial doctorates, and on partnership for innovation. We're talking about mobility in our region, which is a key topic, career services, internships, and much more. So uh, next. If you are interested, of course, you're all invited to, to reach us out. It's going to be on our website very soon for registering, and uh, we hope that you can profit from uh, this new contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Very, very interesting. It looks like a lot of opportunity. Let's uh, pass the word to Ali uh, now.
and I hope that uh, after the presentation there will be questions and uh, proposals to feed in to all these uh, presentations. So I introduce to you uh, Ali Ruma. He is a senior project officer at the Prima Foundation. Thank you so much, Ali, to be with us today. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good evening, but because not good afternoon, because we are at six o'clock. Uh, let me first uh, thank uh, Giuseppe for the presentation. It's very important. I think it's very interesting. And I think we have something uh, overlapping between my presentation and uh, your presentation. And it will, we will have a good discussion, I, I, I guess. Uh, I would like also to thank um, the uh, Ramon Villa from the vision from, for the invitation, and I think it is a pleasure to um, to attend this uh, panel because I remember that I attended the first kickoff meeting of the Faster project with the, all the uh, the member of the project, and it's a pleasure to to see uh, that uh, we are closer also to uh, to to this uh, important uh, project. Um, what I will present to you uh, is not linked maybe to Prima because we are starting the program and we are launching a lot of calls and we are starting the projects, but it's the result of my experience, maybe 20 years of experience as a researcher and as manager. So uh, my present, I will um, present uh, shortly uh, what I would like to, uh, to, to let you know to this afternoon. Please, uh, the first, yes. I select this um, this topic, the role of agricultural research and innovation in rural transformation, and I will focus on the Nina region. And I think it's very important because we have a lot of experience, we have a lot of research in the region, and I would like to, to focus on the region because we are targeting a lot of uh, challenges in the region. Uh, next, please. In this presentation, I, I will start by first by um, look to the rural transformation because right now we are looking, we are dealing with the rural development. No, before, just saying the, the, the first one, just to, uh, so the rural transformation. And then after the rural transformation, I will speak about the research and innovation models because, you know, the research transformation is linked also to the research models in the region. We have some good practices with some existing models, and I propose some orientation for, for the future. Next, please. The, the rural transformation, I think it's very important. Uh, and um, IFAD and the FAO suggest that inclusive rural transformation is a critical factor for the reduction of poverty and food insecurity as well as for stimulating overall growth of the economy. And um, as you may know, that rural transformation is a process in which raising agricultural productivity, increasing marketable surpluses, expanded offer employment opportunities and better access to the services and infrastructure. And the agricultural transformation is a part of a larger structural transformation of the economy in the process of the development. And that involves a shrinking of the role played by agriculture in the economy. So the, 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 the agricultural transformation is a part of the wider rural transformation. So here uh, I would like to share with you some um, indicators. And I think we, you may uh, know the recent report of her, which is very important. I would like to give some uh, indicators, and I will start for the first one, some indicators on the uh, uh, anger, uh, food and insecurity and the, in malnutrition in the region. Next, please. So here, indicator, there's a lot of indicator, but I select some uh, indicator of hang, uh, uh, hunger, food, insecurity, and malnutrition behind SDGs. And here we, we are linked to the SDGs too. And two, and we mainly we target the 2.1 and 2.2, the two target for for the MENA region through the lens of the rural transformation. As you can see from this uh, table, um, uh, this table shows two of three main measures of hunger and food insecurity under the SDGs 2.1. 
So in this table, rural transformation seems to matter as much for severe food insecurity as conflict. This can be seen by noting the, the similar uh, under, under nourishment and food security gaps between countries with high and low levels of transformation and those with uh, and without conflicts. Maybe you can ask here the relationship between the rural transformation and the hunger and food security. Of course, here the rural transformation is a mix of agricultural commercialization, the inclusive development of the non-farm rural sector, and also the development of rural services. So altogether, the three aspects are reflected in the index of rural transformation, which incorporates measures of agricultural labor's productivity, rural income poverty, and an index of uh, rural uh, deprivation. So finally, as you can see here in this, uh, this table indicates that it is the, 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 the Mashra counties that are afflicted most severely with the high levels of hunger and food insecurity. This may be due to, to the high proportion of conflicts country there and the lower level of rural transformation in this, this sub-region. Um, almost four of uh, the five conflict countries are in the, in the Mashrek and the average level of rural transformation in the, in the Maghreb is 30% higher than in the, in the Mashrek. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Uh, let's see the second um, indicator, and I select here the, uh, the, the food self-sufficiency ratio in the MENA region. And uh, as you can see in this slide, MENA counters are highly dependent on imports to meet their consumption needs, particularly for cereals, sugars, and sweeteners and vegetable oils. And I think the, 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 data, the, data, the data here mentioned clearly, showed clearly this issue. So let, let us say that on average, the, the MENA region imports around the half, it's for 40, 54 exactly percent of its cereal needs, 63% of sugar and sweeteners and 75% of vegetable oils, which is really important. Um, next, please. The third one, maybe this is the overlapping with my, my friend from the UFM in employment. And I think this is, I take it from the World Bank uh, since two, year, two years ago, as you, can, as you can see in this table, the mean accounts show in employment rates that are persistently higher than in other regions around the world, mainly for young workers aged between 15 and 24, as already reported uh, by Giuseppe. And also, but for not only for the young workers, but also for, for women. Th this problem is, 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 is accurate in, in the middle, in the middle income as well in some high income countries for the region and has worsened in some of them in the past two decades. Female participation rates in MENA countries are the lowest in the world and have risen a little bit maybe in the past four decades. Uh, let's maybe um, focus a little bit on the youth employed because I will maybe link it with another uh, data. So the youth in employment was significantly higher than general in employment in all the in all the region. And as you can uh, see here, we have the data of uh, 35%, 38. And we have maybe some data, recent data, even more, more than than 30 per, uh, 40%. So, um, however, it was high in the North Africa, as you can see in the table, in, in North Africa is reaching, as I said, maybe around 30% compared to some other other countries, 9% in Latin America, but also we can sum some data is five in, 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 in Bahrain and maybe one in Qatar. And you can see here the difference. So the causes, the main roots of the highest in employment lie in some fundamental economy and demographic issue in the, in the MENA economies. 
So just um, I would like to give you some indicator before going to the role of the research. How can the, the research and innovation can boost and can improve the rural development or the rural transformation in general? Next, please. My first point here, and I think this is mainly the first challenge for us in the Mediterranean, but mainly for the MENA region, that we have the, this linear model of innovation. But this is, as you can, as you, you, you know, this is um, a very big problem for the region because this model is uh, the old model designed to understand the relationship of science and technology that begins with basic research that flows into applied research de development and then diffusion. And as you, you see here in the slide, we have two, uh, two versions of this linear model. The, the first one is the technology push. I think it's the, until the 960. And, but we have, we have also the other, the market pool. But still they are, this is the linear model. And uh, we have a lot of criticism, I think, not only in the Mediterranean region, but also in USA. Th these models in your, what's the main important here for these types of models, they in your, the many feedbacks and loops that occur between the different stage of the processes. And I think this is the main shortcomings. And what's important, so we need another model of innovation uh, call it the interactive innovation. I think the inter in, in, in an interactive innovation, building blocks for innovation are expected to, to come from science or from practice and intermediary, including the farmer, the advisor, NGO, and so on. Uh, as actor in, in the bottom-up process. Uh, so this linear um, model, um, I think it was criticized because of the problem of the interaction between all the stakeholders. Uh, and this is, I think, um, uh, we need to, um, to, th to, sh to look for a new paradigm of uh, uh, innovation model. But, and this new this one is the interaction, as I said, between research, innovator, and facilitators as represented in the blue uh, in the blue box. However, this linear model can have some potential, some very good results. Next, please. Uh, the, the good results here, here. I will focus on maybe the region of South and Mediterranean or North African, uh, and I divide it into two um, aspects: the scientific production and some very good practices. Next, please. Regarding the good practices, here this is an article I think we, I wrote with my colleague from Morocco, Sana Zebach, an article, and I think this article has been recently accepted and it will, uh, we, we are just finishing the, to update some data. And as you can see here, although the, the linear model was, was criticized over several years, we have some very good results. And here I just put the, um, the importance for the fundraising from the H 2020, we have a lot of funds that come from the, since the, not H 2020, but since also FP6, FP7, and H 2020. The uh, publication, the scientific produ production, and you, as you can see here, I think we, some countries are well ranked even in, uh, in the ranking uh, system, like for example, Tunisia, and uh, as you can see here, it's in blue the increasing number of publications through the years. But also another point which is very important, I think, the networking between countries. And here, you can, as you can see in this map, that there's a lot of connection and there is a lot of, uh, uh, let us say, uh, networks that can facilitate the exchange of idea, exchange of knowledge, and uh, exchange of also of students. And I think it's this is a, a very good point. Uh, although this, the, the linear model, we are in this linear model, but we have some advantages in this, uh, in this linear model. Uh, next, please. 
but also this linear model and here we have a lot of example of success uh, uh, in spite of this linear model uh, I want I don't like to be uh, to go in the details because we have a lot of uh, successes like the uh, the aid to decision and we have very good example in the hydrology in the irrigation on olive tree cultivation on fisheries on forestry or also a lot of technical packages plant varieties integrated pest panels we have a lot a lot a lot of uh, let us say uh, good practices and I think this is we are in the linear our our linear model but what we realize that the presence of some of a potential impact outside the current model, we have some maybe other outside the current model, like the development of new thematic approach for research innovation by researcher, not relied by the current uh, uh, linear model. And the major limitation of this linear model, this is the, what we call it the ACIS model, I will go to this, uh, uh, this paradigm, this linear model is more oriented to diffuse the knowledge, as I said, from the research to the end user. It's like it's oriented to the diffusion of results before. That uh, then to promote the breakthrough innovation system approach and rural development. Next, please. Yes, now. What are the orientation maybe for our Mediterranean region and mainly for the MENA region? The first one is the uh, agriculture and innovation, agriculture and knowledge and innovation system. Uh, let me maybe remind you that uh, originally the concept was defined in uh, agriculture knowledge and information system. So it is, let's say, focused on the knowledge and information. And then after that, the, the, the concept is uh, AKS is, um, is maybe linked to the process of knowledge generation and includes act actors outside research and uh, educa ed education. But more recently, we have the AKIS, which is the, uh, as I said, the agriculture knowledge. And I is here, is not information, it's innovation. And the, in the AKIS concept, it has evolved as it has occurred a second meaning, innovation, and uh, then Akis was opened up the more public tasks and to support of innovation. Important characteristics of an innovation system are the institutional infrastructure. It's very important. The funding mechanisms, the network characteristics, and the market structure. And this system is, as I said, is characterized by the fact that the innovation is is not only on the property of the research, the researcher, but it is co-produced, co-produced thanks to the interaction between between farmers, between firms, between the researcher, intermediate actor like the advisor or the distributor, and also um, uh, the, 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 the 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 consumer. But also this the the co-production of innovation will be, of course, co-ownership. It's the co-ownership of the, the solution, a commonly developed, and is the key on the interaction model. And here, when we say uh, that there is a co-production and co-ownership, uh, and here we can speak about the adoption of the results. And if the farmers adopt the results, then we can improve the rural development. Uh, the second, my second point here is the uh, the the, uh, the digital agriculture. Next, please. Uh, no, this I think is okay. The next, please. The the digital agriculture. I think here the point that um, the digital of, um, of agriculture is um, very important um, in this period, mainly. Uh, with the problem of the COVID, and um, it could contribute to the job creation. But uh, as I mentioned, and Joseph has mentioned also the problem for the unemployment for youth, which is around maybe 30, 40% in Southern Mediterranean uh, countries. So the digitalization can maybe help to create the job for the, for, for, for the youth. But uh, there is some um, challenges. 
First of all, the disparity in access to digital technology and services means there is a risk of digital divide, like for the small farmers and other in rural areas are particularly at risk of being left behind, not only in terms of the, the, the literacy, but also to, uh, and access to the digital resource, but also in terms of productivity and aspect of economic and social integration. So the, I think the digital skills and the literacy remain a significant constraint to the use of new technology and are particularly lacking in rural areas, especially in developing countries. So if we think to maybe boost the digital agriculture to uh, in the rural development to create uh, the, the job and maybe to help the young, the, the, the young people, the youth in general, maybe you have to take into consideration these challenges mainly for the small farmers. And as I said, the problem for the digital skills, uh, the skills and the, the, the literacy. My third point for the orientation is the next, is, which is the nexus. Next, please. Here, the, my, my, my third point, and I think this is the third orientation. Um, and uh, maybe as you know that the MENA region is characterized by an extreme water, as well as land uh, uh, scarcity, low resource use efficiency despite growing uh, urgency and increasing human insecurities, being the only region of the decreasing food security. Agriculture production could decrease in the future. And I think we have some indicator in the, the decrease of the production uh, right now. So these trends converge with a rapid, trans, uh, trans, uh, rapid trans, translation towards renew or renewable energy as well as non-conventional water. However, the, the, another problem is the weak governance and large implementation gaps exist in all the sector aggravated by a lack of policy coherence with which, however, it's not, let's say, specific to the Mediterranean region. So this situation, I think, uh, begs to the integration of the management of natural resources and also the integrated governance across the sectors. We have to think about the implementation on the nexus in the Mediterranean region. And on, the, um, on Prima, I think we are launching calls and we are in the second year of launching calls on the nexus and we are um, uh, looking to the implementation on the ground for the nexus to improve to improve the productivity and also to the improve the rural development. Um, that's what I would like to share with you. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ali. Wonderful presentation, also full of new inspira in inspiration. So thank you so much for your perspective. I would like to pass on the word now to Sihan Jebari. And uh, she is our project coordinator of FASTER. So please, Sihan, uh, thank you for being us with us today. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I would like to share with you today uh, the ongoing internationalization of uh, INR Gref uh, uh, institution. Uh, so first slide, maybe first and second. Um, so I I wanted uh, to talk about um, uh, what is actually research excellence and uh, different I mean uh, um, notions related to research. Then um, tell you about uh, INR Gref and uh, the, the the ongoing process related to this internationalization. Um, next. Next again. So uh, actually, research is uh, is a creative work undertaken to produce knowledge, and then to use it. Um, I mean, in a common way. And I can tell you that one of the main characteristic of global human endeavor is the relentless pursuit of new knowledge. 
Um, currently, we know that the globalization of um, research requires actually world class research centers and universities that um, can be can can conduct a very a very high international quality uh, of research. And this is having uh, a direct and uh, indirect uh, significant impact on global society through translation, innovation, and policy information. We also have research, uh, responsible research and innovation, which is a term used by European Union's um, framework uh, program. Um, and it is aiming at addressing uh, societal challenges uh, which can be aligned with the values, needs and expectations of uh, the general public. Next. Uh, actually, research excellence um, uh, is um, a notion that is provided and by academia, but also by the funders. Um, and we know that uh, research excellence is conducted by uh, uh, academia, research centers, uh, 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 national institutions, and also by industries. Uh, and uh, it is actually crucial that it develops widely across the global cultures. It is discipline specific. It is based on new observations and interpretations. Um, it's engaged in trying to solve complex problems of our societies. Um, we can, for instance, mention water scarcity, um, forest fires, pollutions, extreme events, and so on. And these are considered um, by using um, specific methodologies and approaches. It is also uh, crucial to use innovative techniques and, uh, and so on, um, to be updated and, uh, and use this knowledge as, as we said, uh, produced knowledge. Every time we have it uh, uh, available, of course. Um, actually, world-class centers, they, they need to decide and to focus their efforts and resources um, on research performance and profile, being truly distinctive and have the greatest international impact in its research activity. So, for instance, you will find universities or centers focusing on the same uh, challenge, but using different approaches um, and techniques. So there is no redundant uh, uh, work being done, um, I mean, in, in different uh, centers. So this is crucial, actually. Next. So uh, actually, the notion of excellence uh, is is not the same for policymakers and also for for uh, academia, uh, and we are having uh, a challenge of con quantifying uh, the research uh, excellence, um, and this is mainly used for policy purposes. Um, there is currently an extensive debate uh, related to uh, breadth and depth of the meaning of excellence, its capacity to provide quantitative assessments of research activities, and its potential support policy choices. Uh, excellence uh, needs actually um, uh, research that can be uh, um, considering a high ethical standards, uh, engage communities, um, invest policymakers, and ensure gender uh, equality. Next. Uh, promoting research excellence also is, um, is somehow um, challenging so uh, uh, governments find themselves like um, facing um, uh, great talents and new ideas and so on with very limited funding so they uh, they shifted to project funding uh, 
uh, on a competitive base, basis while uh, using instruments designed to encourage outstanding research. We mentioned specifically research excellence initiative. Um, and uh, we have the research excellence framework, uh, which, uh, which is an impact evaluation that uh, includes uh, economical dimension uh, while assessing the research and education institutions. Uh, it was used in 2014 to evaluate the, the programs uh, that covered the period between 2008 and 2013. And it will, the next iteration will, will be in 2021. Actually, uh, the, the main aim is to provide accountability for public investment in research, uh, is to provide a basis for distributing funding, produce robust wide indicators of research excellence for all disciplines and so on. Um, this is actually showing controversies like, for instance, uh, arguing that there is too much focus on the impact of research outside of the university and of the research centers. And also this impact has no real relevance uh, on the quality of the research itself. Next. So to be able to, uh, to manage this assessment, uh, there is uh, key performance indicators they can be domestic or international, and uh, they, uh, they are very useful to inform policymakers. Um, so uh, they have different typologies. Um, mainly, that we, I tr we try to, uh, to gather them in, uh, in five uh, uh, components. So the research background, for instance, that uh, deals with uh, the, uh, the yearly average number of uh, total publications, scientific publications. Um, it, it also displays the collaboration capacity of researchers. Then we have the transference, which is related to um, the number of organized seminars, uh, the number of participants that uh, attended these um, these events uh, and uh, and so on then we have the talent environment which is related to the mass of researchers to the gender diversity to uh, the the number of uh, uh, phd uh, tests defended and uh, and so on then we have the competitive funding um, that uh, allow us to know about the pro the proportion of center budget coming from the international funding, from the private of the, or the public sectors. Um, and uh, finally, we have the leadership that is related to the number of national and international media appearance, um, and also the, the authored reports, uh, the project coordinated, and uh, so on. Next. So now I, I switch to a concrete example, which is uh, Ian Ercrev. So it was uh, created in 1996. Uh, it's actually, it's embodying two, a merge, the merge of two main institutions, uh, one related to forest and uh, the other to rural engineering. They were created during the 60s and then they were merged in 1996. Uh, this institution contributes to the development of the national research policy. It participates to the development of scientific and technological knowledge and its integration into economic and social fields. It, um, it trains doctoral students, uh, organize scientific events and uh, promote partnerships. Um, and nationally and internationally, of course. Uh, I mean, um, this is, of course, an interesting aspect that could allow the center think about being a world-class um, uh, institution. Next. 
The organization of the center is have, uh, is uh, as follows. So it uh, it shows a general director, an administrative council, a scientific board. It has uh, four research uh, departments, um, which are rural engineering, management, and valorization of forest resources. Then ecology and uh, silvopastoral valorization of the non-conventional water resources. Uh, it has uh, a library and which is a kind of legacy from the, the former uh, two uh, research institutions. Uh, and also there is an access to, um, to digital, I mean, there is also a digital library um, and journals uh, on Scopus, Elsevier, Oxford University and so on. Other kind of database like Agricola, Agora, and so on are also available for researchers and for um, students. Um, the, the institution is also having experimental stations, nine. It uh, produces its own uh, um, journal called Les Annales de l'INRGREF. Uh, it organizes uh, every year uh, an international uh, conference um, so these are the main uh, aspects. Next, um, I will give you examples. Uh, these numbers are provided are provided for the period between two thousand sixteen uh, uh, and two thousand nineteen. Uh, so the total, the mass of researchers, uh, the permanent researchers are about seventy three. Um, the senior generation, let's say, uh, is uh, male dominant, sort of like uh, having just 20% of female researchers. Uh, but for the junior um, generation, we can find and see that uh, uh, females are, are even, I mean, their number is uh, about 50%. Uh, um, and then also we have, uh, so this is in terms of research uh, mass, and then field of work, this is um, covering all kinds of rural engineering, water and forestry aspects, um, soil science, bioclimatology, rural economy, uh, agricultural machinery, ecology, irrigation, and so on. So all kind of applied science that focusing on challenges related to the Ministry of Agriculture. Actually, INRGREF is part of the Ministry of Agriculture, Water Resources and Fishery. Um, its main, uh, its main uh, budget is coming from this ministry, but also we are related to higher education. And um, we have some funding also coming from, uh, I mean, the permanent funding is, is coming from, from there also with an amount that is not exceeding 25%, uh, let's say, from the higher education. Um, for the, so we, we also supervise uh, PhD students. We are open to other international universities and we have uh, doctoral students uh, coming from uh, different other countries. Um, we have these uh, nine experiment stations that are um, actually located in different bioclimatic contexts with specific topics and uh, um, commit actually local and regional stakeholders. Um, we also, I think, INGREF is also home of uh, a significant number of researchers, uh, research leaders, and uh, for instance, the current Minister of uh, Agriculture is, uh, is a former researcher at INRGREF. Uh, as far as the integrity aspect uh, is concerned, um, we are missing a personal responsibility. So this financial autonomy um, is, uh, is uh, missing yet. And I hope that it will be possible to work on that for the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, innovation and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship this is a part that need to be definitely strengthened within the uh, the the center next 
Um, so I, the, the main current projects uh, are addressing the challenge of global change adaptation in Mediterranean river basins. They are also focusing on Tunisian vulnerable populations uh, and deal with uh, um, challenges related to MENA region. Um, they also, I mean, these projects are promoting dialogues and collaboration between science and society uh, while introduce, introducing uh, relevant uh, approaches. Uh, this is actually allowing a proactive response to emerging climate change and related impacts. So the, this aspect of climate change is also um, uh, covered. Um, I wanted also to add few uh, numbers related to uh, uh, to the publications uh, on um, in um, in peer-reviewed uh, journals. So for the period of four years, we could manage 400 articles, presentations about 150, and then books and uh, chapters about 80. Uh, about uh, supervising students, so um, we have a uh, few hundreds uh, for the for for this uh, for uh, four years uh, period. Next, so here also a uh, few examples of our uh, current projects. I mean, for the last uh, five years, let's say. Uh, with, um, I mean, we we learn we learned a lot, I think, and we are in a in a continuous progress uh, while being open to uh, uh, to specific approaches and methodologies, um, and also observations and monitoring, uh, modeling tools. Uh, and now we know how to manage the communication and dissemination aspects while dealing with a specific project. Um, how to to manage the party the participatory processes and um, how to 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 get you know the um the the the, the voices of the main stakeholders uh, locally regionally uh, and sometimes nationally uh, uh, also, we we are currently and uh, within the faster project, uh, settling a living lab, uh, which is uh, a quite new, I mean, uh, uh, approach, and uh, we are very excited to deal with it uh, uh, for uh, for the next months uh, right now. Um, these are a few examples of uh, of partners and also of projects that are shown within this uh, slide. Next. Um, so it is here you can you can see events organized and uh, for instance for the last uh, four years we managed about 64 events um, gathering stakeholders, um, train, organizing courses, but also discussing with them um, how they can uh, uh, see their their own way of uh, of dealing with uh, options uh, related, of course, to water or to natural resources in a, in a wide uh, way. Um, and of course, we are trying to introducing them to these uh, new trends and, uh, and techniques to involve them in the decision making process. Um, next. So we know, we know via these uh, tools and techniques uh, how to manage and simulate uh, um, what can happen within a river basin, for instance. Uh, we consider specific uncertainties that are related to climate, to population behavior, to why not revolution, uh, and so on, and see what can be the answer and the response of the environment and, uh, and so on. So this is very useful uh, to set strategies, uh, management, uh, and so on. 
uh, we could, for instance, calibrate the models, helping us to to uh, to know how how much we need to to provide as water in every moment and in every context. And I think this is very useful for the managers. Meanwhile, I think it's important to add that this is not really used or uh, adopted by uh, uh, policymakers or uh, also by the different stakeholders. So some efforts needed to, to be invested in this, uh, in this part. Next. So, I mean, this, uh, uh, all these tasks and uh, um, the way that ENRGF is uh, being operational and uh, functioning is actually related to the to the research staff. They uh, they benefited from a world class education, and this is actually was quite crucial in developing research skills, in um, being independent thinkers, and uh, in also being a problem solver. So this is quite crucial, I would say. They also know about how to create knowledge and uh, have specific expertise in the field. Uh, they are there also, I mean, uh, more and more, the, the new trend is that they gather and work in team um, and uh, engage improving their ability to communicate effectively. They are also subject to competitive nature of research funding, uh, whether at national or international uh, scale. Next. So I, I'm, I'm about finalizing this presentation and uh, all what is written in blue, this is already somehow guaranteed. And of course, uh, it will be very useful to, um, uh, to strengthen the different uh, components. So what is in, in red, it needs uh, to, um, to be really focused um, much more in the future. Uh, so keeping, uh, looking for funding from high quality research funding agencies. This is really uh, very important. It can drive the need to be in the track of methodological advances, which ultimately feed into the international quality of research activity. Um, the cross-disciplinary research, this is, yeah, we, we deal with it. Um, we need to publish even more in impact factor journals and open access to uh, ensure the transparency. Um, gender equality, I would say, in the scientific board, this is very important to be focused. Um, modernize, I mean, the logistics and the research environment also, um, while dealing with these new approaches that uh, that involve uh, the, 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 the social community and so on, we, we feel the needs of um, having sociologists or, I mean, recruiting humanities become somehow something interesting to, um, to, to manage. Or, or for instance, subcontract a consultant, or I mean, um, ways that allow us to um, to manage these aspects. So, next, um, I think also it will be crucial to reward innovation, and um, in order to have new products and to to get to get licensed. Uh, uh, encourage and support more entrepreneurship and consultancy. So we need to be a bit more open on on the next stages of the, the research process. So, uh, gain personal responsibility. This is also very important for managing projects, being independent center and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, um, being more, I mean, Devoting, devoting more time for education in order to transfer to the young generation uh, and prepare them for the future. So um, globalization of research re requires definitely world-class centers. And we hope that at ENR Graph we can join soon the club. Thank you for, for your attention. Next slide. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Siham. This was a wonderful overview. Wow, very interesting. So uh, now we have uh, uh, 15 minutes for uh, receiving questions from the audience. Uh, it's a wide audience. Um, but uh, waiting for the chat to produce some uh, some questions, I think I might break the eyes, no? And uh, ask something. I think you all stress this important relationship between the work of practitioners, which generally are embedded in something we call private sector, no? But I wanted to put on the table, this private sector is highly diversified. No? So I imagine that there is a need for tailored strategies uh, in accordance to the structure of the entrepreneurs, like the, I don't know how to call the model of entrepreneurship we are dealing with. So I imagine that uh, research needs to be taken up by a different set of uh, private activities. This is a big challenge. And so I would like to uh, open it to the, to the panel. Uh, how do you think uh, this um, information can be boosted into this highly diversified uh, environment of the private sector in the Mediterranean? I see Giuseppe reacting. Maybe would you like to break the ice with me? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, you made a question which is uh, which can have multiple answers, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues will give uh, will take different approach. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation; has been very interesting, uh, both for meeting uh, colleagues which I already know very much, and for meeting new colleagues. But going into the topic of how to engage with the private sector, first of all, a point that I would like to make is that. Um, business, industry, private sector do not necessarily overlap in our region. No, uh, we, we know that uh, in many countries we also have big uh, public uh, or owned by the public sector companies which, with which we also should somehow try to engage. But talking about industry in general, there are two main venues where I can see research can contribute. The first of all is creating a clearer uh, pathway pipeline for entrepreneurship. Often I hear that um, students research which have very bright ideas, but they do not necessarily have the managerial skills or awareness how to create a startup, how to create a company. It's it's not evident if you are a researcher for all your life. At the same time, uh, they are the best position for producing new products, new ideas, new services. So in this way, there should be a more systematic support on how to engage on this sector. Uh, uh, there are uh, many ways of doing this. Uh, we know that there are um, projects for creating uh, digital platforms where they can uh, be aware of the opportunities. For instance, I'm thinking about uh, our partner, a startup, Europe Med, where they have created this digital platform where all the researchers can go and look for uh, startup competition, funding opportunities, uh, and so on. Then there are more hands-on approaches which uh, mean that they t some uh, initiatives train researchers in how to create a startup, you know, how to assess is your idea marketable, how to reach a higher degree in uh, market readiness in uh, technology. Uh, on the other side, uh, there is the more uh, traditional path towards employability, which means how to fit the researchers, the students, uh, uh, the best minds into the, the companies where they can acquire hands-on experience. And in this, of course, the part of in the internship uh, seems evident, even though it's not yet developed to the full potential. The Union for the Mediterranean is supporting, uh, since many years, a project called uh, HOMER, uh, where we try to foster uh, Mediterranean internships between the north and the south, and also south-south. And you will not believe sometimes how much of a cultural barrier we have with some employers in making accept uh, uh, the concept of paid internship. I mean, internships are, have to give more value they need to be paid because students, researchers need to sustain themselves while doing it. So we have a variety of many entry points. The issue here is 
giving them more relevance and integrating them more structurally, which also requires some support by the policymakers. Sure, thank you. Uh, Ali, do you want to add on something? Otherwise, there is a question for you also. Yes, I, I think that, um, yes, um, for um, my colleague from the UFM, I think the problem of the startups from the students something really important. But I, I have another idea looking to the, the private sector in the angle of the SMEs. You know, at the SMEs in the Mediterranean is the backbone of the economy in the Mediterranean. So uh, how we can maybe um, attract the SMEs in our research system? I think one of the most important thing that uh, we have to involve the SMEs in the uh, in the funded uh, in the funded projects because sometimes the national regulation, for, for example, in, in Tunisia, uh, the national regulation not allowed to give funds to the private sector and to the SMEs in particular. So it's a problem. But how we can tackle this system? It's, it's, it's a national problem. So then another idea we can maybe involve the SMEs as our partners in like in H2020 pro projects or also in. Uh, in the in the future uh, horizon europe uh, project i think it's very important to 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 involve smes uh, in, as a partner as a key partner in the in the in the project maybe the second point is how we can also attract the smes in in the mediterranean region maybe one of the um, the uh, the issues is yet to maybe to um, let us say um, do some contracting between SMEs and the research and innovation institution. So, so researcher can maybe do some research directly in the, in the enterprise, in the private sector. Then he can, let's say, demonstrate the, the added value of the research innovation for the SMEs. And in this case, it can be, let's say, the first step to attract the SMEs. Because the problem in the Mediterranean, there is, let's say, a huge barrier between the, between the two, uh, the two months, the, 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 the research innovation and the, and the private sector. So I, I did some analysis in Prima and I, I realized that um, SMEs mainly in Northern Mediterranean country are more involved in the fund of the project than, rather than the Southern Mediterranean country. So the, there's a problem for the participation of the South for the, for, for the SMEs. So I think this, um, the private sector is very important. Another point, I think, how we can the private sector fund the research? Because sometimes we we said that yeah the private sector can be involved either either as a SME or private sector in the consortium and they can get funds from the commission or from other. But the other thing, if the uh, the private sector uh, want to invest in the research innovation, so the private sector can give funds to the research innovation. If the private sector maybe participate to give funds to the research innovation institution, I think. The, this will be, um, let's say, um, it will be the, the private sector will be much more, much more involved in this uh, the system, and I think maybe after that the adoption of the results will be easier. Uh, I think that's all for for me because we, if we would like to speak about the private sector, I think it's a huge, huge uh, subject to be discussed. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Uh, Siham, if you want to add on something maybe on experiences with uh, collaborating with innovative farmers in faster also we are boosting uh, a direct relationship trying to build up a direct relationship between uh, researchers and practitioners could you maybe trace out some uh, opportunities like enabling factors factors that help this process you are developing now or other barriers like difficulties because I know you really invested a lot of effort in contacting the people who are interested in the agriculture, uh, who are working in the agricultural sector. So maybe uh, you can share the experience of trying to to bring a bridge between researchers and uh, and the practitioners. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I of course agree on what was already uh, said. And uh, I think it's very important to implement solutions uh, 
with uh, local and regional farmers provide these innovative um, solutions, they need to see it and to experience it. So uh, um, to have, you know, field schools and to implement solution in their own um, plots and, uh, and so on can be really interesting. So, um, and provide them also with more information um, in different ways, like manuals, like uh, fact sheets, like uh, this is also, I think it's very relevant um, to, uh, to, I mean, to keep this, uh, to provide the information and uh, to keep also the, the uh, a continuous contact with uh, the different stakeholders and with um, the private uh, sector. Um, also, I think it's it's crucial to involve them uh, within the funding um, uh, process, and uh, and they need to be part of it so they can be interested uh, when they will uh, when they will be directly involved. Um, because now we can see that. Um, uh, they can hesitate a bit and uh, because they don't really have uh, uh, specific means to, um, to deal directly with the research and with the researchers and so on. Yeah, I mean, these are, are a bit... Oh, thank you, Pierre. Very interesting. Um, we only have uh, two minutes left, so uh, we have to be a bit uh, strict to our timing. But just to close the debate, I think a very key issue is gender equality, you know? So uh, the, the whole economic sector is based on an equality of contribution of all of us to the creation of value, you know? Uh, it's uh, famous and known that we have to make sure that all contributions from all parts of society are valued and put into value in order to uh, create this rural development. So. I would like uh, to ask uh, each of you to put on the table if you know about a specific initiative that could be inspiring in order to um, improve uh, the, the, the uh, opportunities for, uh, for women, both into uh, building up research and excellence or into uh, being as an actor in this bridge between research and entrepreneurship or in the sense of uh, boosting the capacity of small farming environments where women are extremely active and have a high productive uh, uh, role, uh, how to make this, put this more in the light and, um, and analyze uh, the importance and the needs of uh, this part of, of society. Thank you. 